Hi friends, this is Eden here, and today it is my pleasure to share with you this masterclass on natural fragrancing. So in this class, we're going to learn how we can make products for our clients and customers that um, will allow them to enjoy pleasant aromas without all the toxins that synthetic fragrances, um, you know, unfortunately burden us with. Okay, so let's face it, most people want things that smell nice, okay? And there is a phenomenon in our society now that I call aroma conditioning, which is we have um, educated our noses to become accustomed to these fake smells, you know, um, super perfumey things. I, you know, once saw a picture that my midwife posted on Facebook and she had her head hanging out of the window of an Uber um, and she had to do it in order to breathe. She would take big gulps of air then put her head back in the car. Then take gu big gulps of air and put her head back in the car because she's so unused to being around people with who are overly fragranced and the Uber driver was just wearing so much cologne she couldn't even breathe she couldn't even breathe and when you are used to being around natural smells or essential oils only or really no fragrance when you finally get hit with that fake fragrance you realize how toxic it is but most of us are so immersed in it all the time it's in everything it's in our cleaning products it's in our laundry detergent it's in um Anytime we walk into a building, you know, into anywhere we go, we're just inundated with fake fragrances. Sometimes it's even in our food, okay? Um, and it's, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere and it's just so, so toxic. And one of the things that's in fake fragrances is BPA, okay? so. If you um, sell baby bottles in the USA, you're not allowed to sell baby plastic baby bottles that have BPA in them. They have to be BPA free. However, you're allowed to make a lotion with a fake fragrance in it. So you're still dousing your baby in BPA, you know. And oftentimes these synthetic fragrances have almost like 200 compounds in them, you know, that are synthetic, that are lab synthesized, right? just to make one particular smell. So, you know, it's not as simple as you think it is. And a lot of those are serious hormone disruptors. They've been linked to infertility. They've been linked to cancer. They've been linked to um, diabetes, um, linked to so many things that you wouldn't think, you know? So just, just be really careful with fake fragrances. I would just, start off by as much as possible using unscented things or throwing away your your fake fragrances and replacing them with essential oils and other things that we will talk about in this master class okay so what about unscented what does unscented even mean because a lot of times sometimes people think unscented means it has to smell like nothing like it smells like air but unscented does not necessarily mean it smells like air um, there are some natural things that aren't, are unscented in the sense that there is no additional fragrance put on it, right? However, it has its own inherent natural aroma, cocoa butter being one of those things. A cocoa butter that's not refined, that's not deodorized, does have a natural chocolatey smell. Um, bay laurel oil. A very very nutritious amazing oil you'll often find it in Aleppo soap for example which is like a Castile soap that has about anywhere from 10 to 20 sometimes even 30 or 40 percent bay laurel oil and um, it's kind of a, a traditional soap recipe from Syria um, and you know and the Aleppo region is you know where it famously was from um, it has a very strong smell. It's a really beautiful oil. I've used it for um, oil cleansing my face. I've used it in scalp treatments, 
but it has such a strong smell it is such a smoky smell and if you've ever smelt jamaican black castor oil which also has a seriously smoky smell because it's made from burnt ash i mean it's you know roasted co castor beans right which is why it's black right so these roasted castor beans have a particular smell it's like that smoky smell from the roasting bay laurel oil just naturally smells like that but way way kicked up it it, it really is a an unbearable smell really <laughs> but it's such a beautiful oil so if you bought an unscented aleppo bar it might smell like that and you'd be like it's supposed to be unscented well you know unscented like i said does not mean it smells like air unrefined shea butter um sometimes it can just have a mild nutty aroma and sometimes it, the smell is just like insane so it just depends on you know where you get it from what village you get it from what region you get it from um so once you find a supplier who has an aroma of unrefined shea butter that you can tolerate then stick with them um sweet almond oil you know it doesn't smell like air it has the smell of you know sweet um it has that almond like smell you know if you've ever smelt an almond cake or enjoyed an almond drink or whatever it does have that smell naturally so those are things uh, you have to keep in mind when you buy unscented natural products that sometimes they won't smell like air frequently they will but sometimes they won't okay particularly with body products so um, the most obvious category of natural aromas are, um, is the category of essential oils right and so this is one of my favorite essential oil companies it's called Eden's Garden no relation um, I wish it was my company but no it's not it's just a company I just happened to discover on the internet and it's amazing I really love their oils and the quality of their oils and their education and all of the things so essential oils are um, they can be grouped in two ways they can probably be grouped in more than two ways but these are the two ways that I for the most part focus on and I will be covering other things besides essential oils so don't feel like this is only going to be talking about essential oils and you should click off if you only you know if you already are an aromatherapist or an essential oil expert of sorts okay I'm gonna go into like six other categories of natural fragrances so you're not just limited to essential oils so categories um, I create categories of essential oils or families of essential oils. One way is by function and the other way is by aroma. So what does it do um, versus how does it smell? Okay, so some of the functional groups would be, for example, antiseptic, antiviral, antifungal, you know, that kind of category of essential oil something that's gonna kill things off <laughs> um, so in that I would put tea tree and rosemary um, thyme oregano you know for example um, if I wanted to do uh, things that would be say um, cell regenerators you know skin cell regenerators I would do something like sandalwood helichrysum, lavender, rose, um, you know, uh, frankincense, myrrh, and a lot of times that particular grouping of essential oils will be in an anti-aging blend. You'll find them in an anti-aging blend because they have that quality of rejuvenating the cells, right? You'll also find them in things that are targeted towards wound healing. Some of you may know the, the famous... Um, story about the person who's considered the father of modern aromatherapy because we all know aromatherapy is ancient 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 goes back thousands of years thousands of years before Christ even um, you know back to the ancient Egyptians um, so it's like at this point um, when you start looking at modern aromatherapy when they started looking at it scientifically and you know documenting it and believing it you know you know scientists are always kind of late to the party um, um, Maurice Gattfoss is considered the the father of modern aromatherapy because he was working in his lab probably on something completely different he burnt his arm or his arm 
caught on fire and the nearest thing to him was a vat of lavender oil and he just plunged his whole arm in the vat of lavender oil and it healed miraculously um and so that kind of got him researching more and more and more um so yeah lavender has that amazing cell regenerating quality as do many other essential oils so that's function when you're looking at specific one specific function if you were creating a breathing easy blend or if you were creating a skin an anti-aging blend or if you were creating a you know a blend for dry skin or a blend for um you know an immune boosting blend right then you would be looking at things by function and you would create a blend based on that or pick one oil based on that aroma is another thing if you're just doing it for i want my product to smell nice right um of course even if it's functional we still want it to smell at the bare minimum palatable right <laughs> we can stand it um but preferably nice and we'll get to making sure that things that are pungent smell nice later but if you're designing something purely for enjoyment and you're looking for um, aromas or you know kind of groupings of aromas like oh, i want to create something that's really you know uplifting but masculine for guys for you know my beard balm or i want something that's more of an aphrodisiac for you know that's more like of a romantic sensual blend um i want something that's calming for babies for example um whatever your aroma uh intention is for your product you would there are different um families that you should look at and it's helpful to look at them this way even if you're taking uh oils from multiple groups of these um families right and you're not sticking to just one group say for example one group would be floral so in floral you would have obviously all the flowers jasmine um rose lang lang um neroli which is also kind of an orange blossom right um you know geranium would be another one for example um so all these kinds of different uh flowers that you can have in the floral category um so you can stick within one category or you can t- you take that floral note and blend it with something from the earthy cat- category and the earthy category would be you know sort of your deeper more kind of spicier um oftentimes sensual um smells so there you would have your vetiver your patchouli sandalwood um i would say frankincense would probably be in there too and frankincense might be one that kind of also crosses over to um the you know woodsy smells but we'll get to that later um what else would be in there vanilla would be an earthy smell um so spicy um maybe a little bit sweet but really kind of deep dark sort of smells and then woodsy would obviously be things like um you know juniper and cedarwood and fir and pine um those type of smells perhaps even eucalyptus um you know would be in that uh category of sort of you know that sort of woodsy literally smells like wood that fresh wood you know kind of you know feeling as opposed to um um something that's kind of more herbaceous like lavender would be herbaceous rosemary um you know uh, maybe thyme um you know oregano those would be more herbaceous type smells just think of kitchen herbs like green kitchen herbs those type of smells um chamomile would also be in that category um so a lot of things that you would probably find in your kitchen tea um or in your in your kitchen pantry or spice rack a lot of those would probably go into that herbaceous smelling sort of category um and then you'll have things that are like 
um, fruity, right? For example, citrus, most of them are going to be citrus, honestly, because it's hard to find an essential oil that's sweet and fruity that's not a citrus. So your bergamot, your um, orange, mandarin, yuzu, which is like a Japanese grapefruit that is just intoxicating. I mean, that smell is amazing. I'd actually forgotten how much I love it until now. And um, lemon, um, grapefruit, those sort of things, right? Um, so these are all different um, categories of aroma. Um, and there are so many different books that you can look at that will um, sort of kind of help to teach you about that. Uh, my favorite book for essential oils by function, if you're just looking purely at like what they do, is the Aromatherapy Workbook by Marcel Lavabre. I've had it probably for close to 20 years now, maybe a little, um, yeah, it's probably been 20 years because I got it in my mid-20s. So I've had it for a long time and it's always relevant. It never goes out of um, style or uh, relevance. It's very sciencey. So if you really don't like things like that, because you may have to get a dictionary just to understand some of the words. It's, you know, it really goes there. Um, but you will learn so much. And you don't have to read the whole thing at once. You can maybe read up on just one, you know, essential oil at a time or one that you're interested in. But it'll help you get a little into some of the science. It'll help you learn about making your own different blends and so forth. Um, so I think that this book is worth getting and just having in your library. Just even, I'm really one who's into vibes. <laughs> so... It just it just kind of raises the the whole vibration of your library to have something you know that's there that just kind of regulates the standard a little bit and eventually even if it feels like too much initially you will rise up to meet the standard of this book it really is a must have for anyone who's serious about any kind of aromatherapy even if it's just for learning for yourself for how to create blends for yourself that are healing for yourself all right. Um, oh, and I just, I forgot to add um, that essential oils also not only have a physical effect, they have an emotional effect and they have a spiritual effect. So the emotional effect is due to the fact that, um, you know, the center of our, the part of our brain that um, is sensitive to smells is kind of in... Um, sort of in our brain stem area, right? And it's also the part of the brain that controls our involuntary um, responses and actions, like it controls breathing, it controls um, hunger and hydration, you know, thirst. Um, it controls um, sexual response, reproductive response, things that you don't necessarily always control that are kind of like your body just does them. So that's where your sense of smell resides. And so there are a lot of emotions that, you know, we store, you know, our, our brain is like a computer just because I don't remember every single second that has happened in my life somewhere in my brain that information is stored so you can find that 25 years from now i might remember something that happened when i was two and a half or when i was 12 and be like oh my god i'd forgotten that that happened how did my brain even go to that thing you know but there may be a trigger that helps me remember that and so senses of smell are really important to people um you know maybe you know, whenever you went to your grandma's house, she was always making a certain kind of dessert that smelled like vanilla. Or, you know, maybe if you were attacked by someone and <laughs> they were wearing something, you know, on them that smelled a certain way, you know, if you smell that, it just, you know, creates a visceral response to something. But there are also inherent qualities, you know, that because these are chemical compounds from the plant, right? There are inherent qualities that um, aromas have that trigger certain responses, which is why um, people will tell you that lavender is relaxing or that um, cedar and frankincense and you know sandalwood, certain things are always found in meditation blends. Or if you go to a Catholic church, you know, when they kind of 
come around with that smoky smoke that smells really good but can sometimes be overwhelming it's frankincense um there's a reason the baby jesus was given frankincense as a gift like all these things have emotional um often spiritual connotations so it's always interesting to learn from that perspective as well and there are many books that focus just on those aspects and don't do as much of the medicinal stuff so when you're choosing books um or you're building up your library of is books on essential oils try to get the full spectrum because each author is also coming to it with their own experiences almost like cooking in that you know one person isn't going to know all the ways to use you know a pomegranate you know five different cooks will have five different spins on the pomegranate so you know just kind of widen your repertoire a little bit with that so um Sometimes essential oils don't work, which is why I've created other categories in this masterclass on how to fragrance your products naturally in the event that an essential oil um, is not appropriate. So you're thinking, okay, in what cases would an essential oil not work? For example, sometimes um, essential oils, essential oils are like the essence of the plant you know they distill it down to the very essence of the plant so they are very potent one or two drops will go a long way and so sometimes even those one or two drops are just too potent for the people that you're serving oftentimes for example babies um there are only two or three essential oils that are okay for a, a newborn you know lavender chamomile um, and I think maybe at three months you can start introducing Melissa um, or Neroli. Um, so, you know, you just kind of have to be really careful and do really super low doses. But I can also imagine in the event, maybe someone who's chemically sensitive, um, maybe someone who is pregnant and is really kind of sensitive to smells, um, maybe someone who is, you know, coming off of chemo, or, you know, they're just different categories of people that might not be able to do um, some essential oils or essential oils for a period of time in their life due to an illness or just a physical condition or a transition that they're going through. Um, you know, there are contraindicated things like there's some essential oils that are amazing essential oils, but are highly contraindicated for pregnancy. Um, for example, sage, sage essential oil can cause miscarriages it can also it definitely is like if you want to dry up your milk you would drink sage tea so if you are nursing or breastfeeding um your baby and you know you don't want to use sage essential oil because it's an anti-galactagogue right so just kind of being aware of things like that um sometimes essential oils you make an amazing blend. Maybe you're making a really amazing blend for dandruff or a really amazing blend for wound healing. But the smell is so, so pungent. It's like, yes, it works, but what human is going to be able to tolerate that scent? So in those particular cases, what are you going to do, right? Um, sometimes there is no essential oil for the aroma you're going for. So for example, maybe sometimes you want a strawberry smell. I'm just going to lock my door I can hear my kids and husband have come home just hold on so in any case let's just say for example um, you want a, a strawberry essential oil there is no strawberry essential oil so you have to look for alternatives to get that strawberry smell right um, sometimes for example um, you know, going back to the overpowering thing, um, it doesn't mean that because it's an overpowering aroma in the end that you have to exclude it. It just means that um, you may need to... Okay, so sometimes, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you might need to blend it with something or cut it with something. It's just like cooking. You might need to add something to enhance the flavor of something or just to limit the flavor of another thing that's, but that is essential, right? So you might need to add other kinds of natural fragrancing just to round out the smell of the thing that you want, right? So, 
Um, hydrosols, distillates, and floral waters, they're often called the same thing. Um, so, you know, whenever you see those, just kind of be cognizant and you just want to look for um, the description to make sure that they actually are hydrosols, distillates, and floral waters, right? And so what are they? As you can see, this picture on the left has this huge distilling equipment, which is the kind of equipment that's usually used to make um, essential oils and hydrosols um, at scale. And um, so in the process of distilling the essential oils, you know, at a certain temperature, the essential oil comes off and it's collected. Um, and then at another temperature, the, the distillates come off, right? So a watery component, and you can see to the right here some pictures of lemongrass hydrosol from Jeannie Rose's website. That's another person who has great books and great knowledge. You should follow her. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing her way, way, way back in the day when I was doing writing for holistic topics and stuff. And um, she's really knowledgeable, and I think sometimes she produces her own essential oils and hydrosols in smaller quantities. But you know, you really want to be careful that you're getting something that's from the, that's kind of a byproduct from the process of making essential oils. And distillates and hydrosols are really useful um, to use when um, there's only so much essential oil you can put in a product before, you know, that you can safely put in a product, right? Because even though lavender, you know, essential oil is good for you. If you had something that was 15% lavender essential oil, that is way too strong and it would actually be toxic, you know, but 1% or 2% or under that even is fine, right? So, but maybe at that percentage for certain products, maybe you wouldn't be able to smell the essential oil or maybe, you know, it would wash out and eventually with essential oils, essential oils do evaporate. So over time, something might lose its fragrance. These are all considerations. Um, there are ways that you can enhance, you know, that aroma um, by adding the hydrosol. So let's just for say, for example, you scented something at 1% with lemongrass and then you added, you know, 5% of the lemongrass hydrosol you get a really nice, strong lemongrass scent, right? Um, without being toxic. And also the hydrosols tend to be um, less expensive than the essential oils because the essential oils, you're only gonna get a tiny bit, whereas the hydrosols, you get a lot more. So the difference between rose hydrosol and rose essential oil is astounding. So if you're making anything aqueous, always consider adding a little bit of the hydrosol so that you don't have to use as much of the really super expensive rose essential oil. So that's one way you can use it, um, you know, and stand, you know, they, they stand alone. Like you could probably scent something with hydrosol alone if it was a sort of like a spray, like a toner or a curl refresher or something that's very aqueous and doesn't have a lot of much else added to it in terms of oils and emulsifiers and things. So what hydrosols are not, okay, this is where you want to be careful. Sometimes people will call something rose water, and it might be rose water, but it's really an infused water. It's not a rose hydrosol or a rose distillate. It's just a rose water in terms of it being a rose tea. So an infused water would be more like a tea of something, right? Um, Condensed water is something that is, um, you know, when they dehydrate certain botanical materials, whether they be herbs, whether they be fruits or whatever to make food powders in the process of evaporation. So normally like in nature, when things evaporate, they form clouds, we see the clouds in the sky. So basically this is like collecting. <laughs> so I know this is a really silly analogy, but I don't know how else to put it. So you know, they, they're able to collect that water that's evaporating off um, into a liquid, right? Instead of a cloud, instead of it just kind of dissipating and going out into the atmosphere of the factory, you know, the way it would in our home if we were um, dehydrating things at home. They're able to collect that water as it's evaporating off the plant material and create a condensed water. And oftentimes that water will have aromatic 
components of the food that is being dehydrated. So, um, you know, you could so you can get condensed water that would smell like certain fruits or like certain herbs and so forth. And that would um, have aromatic qualities. It would not have medicinal qualities necessarily the way that hydrosols have medicinal qualities the same way that essential oils have medicinal qualities just in a much milder form. Whereas condensed water, you'd just be really, for the most part, um, using it for the aroma, but at least it would be a natural aroma. So it's something benign that you're adding that is enhancing um, the cosmetic appeal of a product without actually adding toxins. You're not creating a medicinal effect or you know a healing effect, but you are creating um, an enjoyment effect that actually does not come at the expense of our health the way that the synthetic oils do. So um, another thing you want to be careful of, some people will call things floral waters, but it's really essential oils added to water. And you're like, oh, but you know, essential oils don't mix with water. Well, then, then they add a solubilizer to make the essential oil blend into the water and then they have to preserve it because it's an oil and, and then it's, it's just a whole bunch of stuff. So when you read it, if it doesn't say, you know, the plant name distillate or the scientific name of the plant um, and nothing else, then it's not a hydrosol, okay? So in the description box below, I'm going to put a, f a link from Formula Botanica that um, one of my favorite subscribers, Dominique, um, was kind enough to share with me in a, in a message. Um, so we'll put that there. And you can take a look at um, that to figure out things. And they also offer great courses if you're looking for a course you want to buy on how to make things. So infusions. I'm just going to pause this for a second. Okay, so um, the next would be infusions. So sometimes if you infusions smell aromatic and sometimes they don't. Um, usually they do have a kind of a smell, um, especially if you don't make them too weak. So if you're using them for the purpose of having a smell, then you probably want to make them pretty strong, you know, stronger than you would as, than you would otherwise, right? But in oil, it's just not going to smell as strong as an essential oil or some of the other categories that I'm talking about. So what I would do is... I would fill the jar three quarters to seven eighths full and then top it off with oil um, just to make the smell of the oil resulting as strong as possible. But just understand that once you add that little bit of oil to you know a whole bunch of products, you're going to lose some of that. So what it might be good for is balancing or rounding out some of your other things or it works well when it's the only oil or it's the principal oil in a blend, um, then you could probably get a good amount of that aroma. In water, um, you know, that works really well for sprays as well, but when you start going into emulsions, you might lose some of the aroma, like I said. So kind of just be cognizant that when you're doing in infusions, that you are going to lose a little bit of the smell. Um, you can do infusions in other things too, like glycerin and propane diol and honey and vinegar. And um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other things, aloe vera juice. Um, and my botanical extracts workshop shows you exactly how to do that. And it is free um, to people who have subscribed to my email newsletter. There's a link in the description box if you'd like to subscribe for the email newsletter, um, knock yourself out. You get a whole bunch of resources like this particular class that I'm doing. This is the only free class that's in my library of free classes for my email news subscribers that I'm putting on YouTube. Um, and then the rest are just things that my email <laughs> subscribers see. All right. So if you want to sign up for that, you can sign up in the link below and it's totally free. Okay, so natural fragrances. All right, so fragrance oil 
is a no-no, like I said, and oftentimes you'll know that it's a fake fragrance when after after the word fragrance you see um, in brackets or parentheses, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, the word parfum, P-A-R-F-U-M, um, and that basically is fancy speak for fake, right? It sounds nice and looks nice, but it's really synthetic. Um, but there are some 100% natural fragrances and they have to be 100% natural fragrances. And I've put links to some examples in the description box below. Unfortunately, they are all US companies currently. Um, I reside in the US and these are the ones that are easy to find. And honestly, most of these kind of resources are in the US, but there are a lot of resources in many other countries. I just haven't found as many in the natural fragrance department, but because you need so little fragrance to make something smell nice, I, I'm i okay with you importing the, the, the fragrance of your choice um, once you've decided on one um, in bulk if you need to. It's worth it. So look in the description box and I will put the companies um, with the fragrance concerned right there. Okay, so this is not to be confused with things like nature identical essential um yeah nature identical oils is what they call them i'm sorry i put the word essential oils there but um nature identical um fragrance oils um might have some components to them like some they may consist partially of essential oils or they may consist partially of natural components um from you know different um processes however uh, they do contain some synthetic components they're nature identical in the sense that it's a fragrance oil that is really closely mimicking the essential oil uh, its essential oil counterpart so it could be a sandalwood nature identical fragrance oil but it smells so similar to, to sandalwood essential oil right so that's what they're saying nature identical they've kind of nailed down the components that they can create that can make it smell exactly like that whereas the 100 percent natural fragrances they are not essential oils so they don't have the medicinal qualities however they um often have um components from different parts of manufacturing so partially from the food making process partially from other kind of manufacturing processes where they're able to take certain compounds from natural things and sort of group them together. But nothing is synthetic um, in the sense that it's kind of manufactured in a lab. It's 100% non-toxic. It's definitely not medicinal, but it does have the effect of giving the fragrance that you want. So it's worth looking into if, you know, fragrance is really a huge issue for you, but you really are determined to keep that natural sort of phthalate free, BPA free, synthetic fragrance free standard. Okay. And so, um, fruit and other organic waters. Um, so for example, in the, the making of certain things like certain kinds of fruit juices, um, you know, like I've seen strawberry distillate. So from the part, the, from making strawberry juice concentrate for juices and so forth, um, sometimes you can find things like that. Um, and those are kind of fun additions to your products, um, especially for things that it's hard to find the essential oil for. Okay, so one class of products that really deserves a special mention is Phytosense. Now, Phytosense is made specifically um, by, I believe it's called Active Technologies, but it might be called something else. It's a parent company for Formulator Sample Shop, and it's basically um, oil extracts. So these are scented oil extracts. So they are able to extract both the scent of the plant in question, as well as some of its function, right? So it's really similar to an essential oil, but not quite as potent, but, you know, sort of more beneficial than just a natural fragrance. 
and less potent than essential oil and still gives you that cosmetic appeal of fragrance. Now, what's really interesting about this is that there are a lot of things that you ordinarily would not be able to get um, in, a, you know, in a natural aroma form like pumpkin and goji berry and plum and this and that. Um, they have so many different kind of interesting things. Cucumber, um, they might even have a melon. They have so many. I, I want to say at least 30, maybe 36 or something like that. Um, so it's really kind of a nice addition to your products. Also, uh, it's a nice way to be able to use expensive things. So for example, this flower here on the left is jasmine. Um, jasmine essential oil is very expensive, but jasmine phytoscence, even though it's pricey, it is definitely not as pricey as jasmine essential oil. So you kind of get the benefits of jasmine, uh, for skin and hair, as well as the beautiful scent, um, at a fraction of the cost, right? So kind of interesting things like coconut. Coconut is really common in kids products um, and in lots of different hair products people seem to like the scent of coconut but most of the time it's an it's a fragrance oil so now you can have a natural coconut scent that also has some of the coconut benefits so phytosense is definitely worth mentioning i'm going to put the um link to both the usa store and the uk store they have a uk store now um, in the description box so floral waxes Floral waxes are made by a process called enflorage. I'm sorry, I didn't type it up here. Um, but basically, um, it's they take um, flowers and they put them on layers of, um, I believe it's a kind of like a coconut butter or coconut oil, and then they let the, you know, the flowers seep into that. Um, you know, and then they put wax paper on top, I think. And then after a period of time, they remove those flowers and then put a new set of flowers on top and the aroma seeps into the oil again. And then they take that layer off and, and do it again. So repeatedly layering flowers or aromatic components over this quote unquote wax, which is really kind of more like an oily butter they're able to create a very highly scented wax. Um, and again, that's kind of less expensive than an essential oil. Um, but you know, it's not cheap either. So it's, it's a really kind of a nice touch. I have worked with floral waxes myself. I would imagine that they would be nice in emulsions. Um, maybe in a whipped butter as well. You would probably need to, I don't know if they whip easily without melting, so you might need to melt them. But it's kind of something interesting to consider. Um, so, and oh, and it's also kind of like an oil infusion, right? When you're doing um, florage, because you're gonna get some of the properties of that oil, of that plant in there too. So, inherent fragrance. I do not know what that sound was. Okay, it's gone away, thank goodness. Um, inherent fragrance, some things like I talked about earlier have their own inherent fragrance, like cocoa butter, like sweet almond oil, like mongongo oil when it's cold pressed, has a really um, sweet nutty flavor. Some people don't like it, I find it intoxicating. Um, stone fruit kernels, so your um, apricot, peach, cherry, um, plum, all those fruits of summer, you know, they, when they're cold pressed, have a really, really great smell, actually. Um, I believe cherry does too. Um, so cold pressed kernels of those stone fruits have a really, really sweet natural smell. So that's kind of something to consider too. If you're doing an oil blend that you want to smell a certain way and you just kind of make sure that the bulk of it has those oils in it, then you can sort of use that to your advantage in creating something. All right. So if you liked this masterclass, if it was helpful to you, please be sure to like the video, subscribe if you're not subscribed. Um, and I'd love to know in the um, comments below what your favorite fragrance is.
you know, real fake, um, whatever. What kind of smell is your favorite kind of smell? All right. Um, I think mine, oh, obviously we all have lots of different smells that we like, but I would say that one that stays consistent for me over time is juniper. I just, I don't know what it is about juniper. I just love the smell of juniper. I find it intoxicating. I'd forgotten about yuzu. Um, I do like yuzu too when it's really good and, um, you know, when it's true yuzu, um, but it's kind of a bit more rare and hard to find. But yeah, so I would go with juniper um, as a constant <laughs> of something that I like um, in both room scents as well as body products. All right. And um, if you want more classes like this, like I said, feel free to subscribe to my newsletter. My newsletter is the only place that I really, I wouldn't say the only, but it's the predominant place where I share workshops like paid workshops that are coming up or classes or courses that I'm releasing. Um, you know, once or twice a year, I'll offer free classes to my list. Um, that's coming up over the holidays. Um, you know, and I also do a little bit on my Facebook page too. I try to keep my YouTube, um, channel pitch free other than the pitch to join my newsletter. <laughs> so if you want more of that, um, and you're serious about actually starting a business, um, then you'll enjoy my newsletter. If you're not serious about starting a, a business in skin or hair care, and you just want to learn about natural products, then you probably shouldn't subscribe to my newsletter and you should just, um, you know, enjoy the channel, enjoy the information that's on it. All right. Either way, I thank you for being here. I thank you for making it all the way through this video. And, you know, I will see you in another video in the future. I probably won't do one for a while because I'm focusing on workshops right now. But, um, you know, in the near future, probably in the new year, I'm going to come out and teach you how to make a full Moroccan rose um, facial care collection. All right. Love you guys. See you soon.